Artifacts, our firm and, um, and the architectural historian Rochelle Baum worked together uh, to provide the city of Bangor with a uh, architectural survey uh, recently on the, in the Broadway district and uh, what's called the Tree Streets area. We're gonna show you in just a moment where that is. Uh, but the architectural survey included 63 structures in the Broadway historic district and 91 structures in the Tree Street study area. The background image that you see here is actually a beautiful rendition of Bangor. It's called a panorama. It was done in around 1875. And if anybody's interested, you can download uh, this hand-painted copy from the Library of Congress. Go in and you can search for bird's eyes or, or Bangor panoramas. And you'll see they were done for many of the communities in Maine. We found them to be very accurate. So this really is a pretty good depiction of Bangor in, uh, in, in, in 1875. Our contacts on the city side, um, again, I mentioned here, uh, we had myself involved, Rochelle Baum, uh, Emerson Jones. And on the city side, we worked with Ann Krieg and Jeff Labrie. Uh, and Maine Historic Preservation Commission, we worked with uh, Michael Goebelbain, who you may know or have worked with in the past. Uh, we ha this had to meet state standards, um, which means, and you'll see farther on, that we had to collect an, an, an enormous amount of information about this uh, buildings in this district. So um, moving on. This is, a, these graphics kind of, and I'm gonna use my um, pointer here. The graphic on the upper left corner, if you can see this, shows two boundaries. The red line is actually a 1973 National Register boundary for this part of the city. It's called the Broadway Historic District. It's listed on the National Register, and it was really put forth more from the State Historic Preservation Office. The boundary of Bangor's Broadway Historic District is this blue line that you see around the, this perimeter here. It basically runs from State Street up to the park, up to Broadway Park. This little graphic is an interesting um, piece that was attached to the 1973 National Register listing nomination paperwork that went in and they did sketches of some of the buildings, several of which are no longer there. Mm -hmm. And this graphic on the right is basically our base map that showed all the structures that were included in the district survey <clears throat> And we've indicated by highlighting what some of these buildings are that would be considered non-contributing. Within the district, there may be some buildings that have been so modified over time that they no longer contribute to the rest of the district. And that's the case. Um, not to point anyone out in particular, but uh, this happens to be, I think, 118 Broadway. It's the large white building that's being renovated right now on the corner of Somerset Street and Broadway. So we skipped Pine Street. We begin this uh, Tree Street study area, basically runs from Essex Street over to Forest Avenue this way. And it goes from Somerset Street up to Garland Street. So this entire block was, uh, was, was also included in the study area. Um, what you see here up on the upper left are karma forms. Jeff, did we send out a copy to the commission members of what those look yeah, like? Yeah, she did, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's chock full of valuable information that we glean from various sources when we do a historic survey like this. Um, but it, it's broken down into three parts. One is the architectural features. The other is the historical data on the building. And then finally, the environmental data, which deals with its location, the orientation of the building, and some other factors. In this case, the karma form that you see here, this is the karma form. And again, karma stands for a cultural and architectural resource management archive. It's basically a digital format that was developed by DOT and the State Historic Preservation Office uses it on all their surveys now. So the karma forms for all of these uh, 155 buildings had to be filled out to this extent. Now the commission has that information available for themselves to use in going forward with good base information on what, what's important about these various buildings. Um, so do you wanna speak a little bit, Emerson, about inputting here? 
Certainly. So in addition to putting all the information to the Karma forms, these forms had to be filled out on the, uh, the Karma workbench that the state provides. So all this information had to be in, put in uh, electronically through, the, through their server. Um, and in, in addition to the information, the information is actually then plotted in to these various locations indicated by the X's on this map. So all this data is linked to a specific geographic location, which we of course then match to the actual building itself for every uh, structure, whether it it's a house or carriage house, garage, anything over 50 years old, the information is in there, it's linked and you can actually go into the state's website and actually view their karma viewer and you can go to any of these houses and open it up they'll have information on the left and then use a little uh, tool icon up in the corner you can then use that to then open up the karma forms view those individually or the actual photos themselves as, as individual files and as we mentioned before in addition to the file um, having all this information inputted for every individual structure, every individual structure had to be photographed. And Mike Pullen uh, did put made some did some wonderful photography for us, documenting all of these structures, as can be seen here with our example on the beginning of our Broadway district. As Emerson says, in a property like this, it'll actually be two entries. There'll be an entry for the main house. This is the Hayward Pierce house down uh, near State Street on Broadway. And there'll be another separate karma form done for the outbuildings, like in this case, the carriage house on the back or the barn. So that's provided for every structure. So this is an interesting story of some of the things we learned about Bangor and the developmental history of this east, and east side of the city of Bangor. Uh, the map that you see here that I'm circling, this is a map done in 1801. It's called a Park Holland survey map. It basically laid out large tracts of property for settlers, mostly from Massachusetts that were given or bought property up here in Bangor to come and uh, inhabit. So the one that I've highlighted right here is lot number 11. And it's really instrumental. This is a lot that's instrumental in the development and the layout of Bangor's uh, east side of the city, the street grid. Here it is a little bit larger, you can see it. Um, again, this number 11 represents a tract of land that's roughly 77, 80 acres of land. So the city, um, uh, or the uh, developers, which was Stetson, Lapiche, and French, um, two of them from Massachusetts, one from Maine, retained no other than uh, Charles Bullfinch, the renowned architect, uh, in 1801 and 1802 to lay out the initial grid pattern for this part of the city of Bangor. Uh, this was called the Kondeskieg with a C, Kondeskieg Point plan uh, of Bangor. <clears throat> the developers, Stetson, Lapiche and French then intended to, after the parcels were laid out, to sell off tracts of land in pieces. Again, this was from the original lot number 11 uh, in Bangor. So Charles Bullfinch, for those of you that don't know, was the uh, architect of the Massachusetts State Building. He was the architect of the Maine State Building. He was involved in the Capitol Building in Washington, DC. Very important uh, US uh, architect. This was Bullfinch's plan. So here it is, I apologize, turned on its side. This is Bullfinch's original layout right here, which pretty much put in the pattern for uh, what is now Exchange Street, Pine Street, um, Oak Street, uh, no, Pine is up here, uh, French. French Street, and Pine up here. So he basically did the layout for this part that I'm circling right here. But by 1822, the date of this plan, they further looked at developing lot number 11, which this is still a part of, all the way up through and almost to the extents of where Broadway Park is today. So here's the first time we see mention of Stetson Square. Stetson Square is that broad boulevard that we all enjoy now that runs from Oak Street, uh, York Street, excuse me, all the way up to Somerset Street. Uh, and it was laid out for purpose, as you'll see in just a moment. 
Um, but I thought this was really interesting. Here it's called Kandesky with K-E-E -E at the end. So this is called the plan of lot number 11, Kandeskig, Kandeskig Point in Bangor. So all of these graphics and plans, by the way, are available in digital research anyone can do at the Registry of Deeds. You merely type in early lots. This happens to be volume two, one of the early uh, tracked volumes at the registry. In this case, page 46. So in the research we did, we found many, many maps that describe Bangor's development. Really quite interesting. Anything to add on that? Um, so let's go one more. So moving on to a few years, right around actually the same time as the last map. So before the additional lots were laid out in Stetson Square, but we can already see how uh, Bullfinch's plan is already being laid out in a grid. And we will in the next slide see how that that is then extrapolated throughout the west, I'm sorry, the eastern side of the city. We can already see how that contrasts with the, the west side of the city where we have much more organically occurring roads that are just going wherever they need to go to connect various things. You know, even as we see kind of radiating out on the east side, whether it's going up to the Kanduskeg or heading up along the Penobscot, we have very organically occurring roads. Um, so we have this, this grid that is being put in place here by Bullfinch and Lapiche and French and Stetson. Um, what, was, what was the road called? That, is, that's, that's the county road uh, he's indicating there, which is now known as State Street. This is State Street right here. Yep. And they show a crossing. There's a crossing of some sort. So I don't know if you all know, but East and, East and West Bangor have always had this thing back and forth, right? So whether you came from the east or the west side, I mean, I happen to come from the west side. So this is kind of um, unusual to see that there were things that weren't as structured as the east side. So we'll just let it go with that. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is in 1853, this is the, the walling map. And it starts to show how the at grid has been extrapolated throughout the city on the east side, um, all the way past up, uh, Broadway Park, heading out State Street past uh, the City Commons, now known as Chapin Park, and just a really large development of the area. We can see a huge amount of growth in just those 30 years. Um, yeah. And also, actually, it's important to note that on this map, um, this, the trees that line Stetson Square um, are indicated. No other trees are really shown throughout the map, but the ones along Stetson Square and lining Broadway, because they were such an important feature of the area of that specific, of Stetson Square, that they were important enough to include on this map. Mm -hmm. And so our, air, our um, study area was bounded by Chapin Park and Broadway Park and included the wonderful urban landscape of um, Stetson Square with the double uh, what is this, esplanade, mm -hmm. esplanade of elm trees, as you can see on the, the right. So to, uh, Chapin Park here at the top used to have a pond. It was uh, both Chapin and Broadway were designed by um, Frank Blaisdell of Boston, landscape architect. They had beautiful naturalizing features to them. The pond in Broadway Park, Circle Ear, is, is no longer. But you can still see the relief in the ground when you go to Broadway Park. You can see a little bit of the essence of the topography where this pond used to be. And uh, interesting, <clears throat> urban landscape features were really important to this early part of the city, its development. Also in our in our studies using uh, the use of the Sanborn fire insurance maps were very helpful in learning and seeing the development and growth and changes over time, especially when the fire went through what things existed before and after and how those things had changed. So this is an example from a, the Sanborn map of 1906. We used um, Sanborn maps from several decades and these are all available through the University of Maine Fogler Library as digital files that anyone can go and download. I wanted to just point out um, a couple of features here. Again, this is before the fire. So here's Broadway. Here's where it widens out to Stetson Square. Um, this house that I'm circling right here is the Nicholas Norcross house you're going to see in just a moment. Um, these structures here were both burned out in the Great Fire. And when the Diocese of Portland wanted to build their the Catholic high school here, John Baps, 
they physically lifted this house up and moved it down on French Street, which is an amazing accomplishment in itself. So this is the beautiful brick house called a John Hamm house on the corner of Somerset and Broadway. So a lot of these buildings still exist. Um, some are gone, but um, the district still has a lot of integrity. Mike, what do the colors mean on that map? Is it again? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Matt. Which ones aren't? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, red buildings indicate a brick structure. Um, yellow is a frame building. Uh, they made that distinction, as Emerson said, these were really intended for fire insurance purposes. They, we found them to be extremely accurate um, in depicting what building footprints look like. If you look closely at this is where our office is, and it has every single bay of the building indicated here. It tells how many stories it is. Uh, it tells if it's an outbuilding with an X on it. These were carriage houses normally um, on the back. It explains if it's a if it's a church, how tall the tower is, all that information is in these Sanborn maps. They came out, what, about every five or six years, uh, were refreshed every five or six years, began in around late 1800s. So they're really, really quite precious. Um, this is a photo on Broadway of um, a building that no longer exists. This was called the Ephraim Polk House, and it was on the corner of Somerset and Broadway. Uh, if you're looking back down Broadway, there's the brick building beyond that's still there today, uh, double house. Uh, this is where the big white modern building is constructed. So this was demolished in uh, the late 60s to make room for that uh, building. This lot and several of the lots starting at Somerset Street and going towards the park, Broadway Park, were larger than the parcels down here but from Somerset down to State Street. So that enabled construction of much, much larger houses. This is attributed to Darius Lawrence, the architect. Um, it is highly detailed if you look closely. Um, and uh, it's in the Italianate style. You see the cupola at the top looks very familiar to the one up on Highland Avenue. If yeah. you know Reese, per Reese Perkins house, yeah. uh, which is also attributed to Darius Lawrence has a very similar, almost identical cupola at the top of it. And I think on this picture, it's also worth noting just the, the presence that the Elms presented mm -hmm. along this area and why they were important to include on the 1850s map. Yeah, I'm very unfortunate to lose those. Um, the scale of those is so large and beautiful. They were a paracel sort of tree in their shape, really important urban landscape features. So some of the architects that did work in the study area that we were in, Benjamin Dean did several structures, Frederick Patterson, um, local architect, George Orff, is, this is the building that our office is in, Charles Bryan, a very important, actually national architect who began here in Bangor, Wilfred Manser, who you've all, the commission seen much of his work in Bangor, and Darius Lawrence, the house that we just looked at you know, six uh, plus influential architects uh, that created beautiful structures uh, within the district. So beginning with um, some of the earliest buildings that we saw in this district are these brick buildings. And while we don't know exactly why they were chosen to be brick buildings, if there was a Boston influence potentially, but these are located on and around the Stetson Square area. But we did find this very, uh, interesting information about the creation of Broadway and Chapin Parks, in, in which the criteria or um, yeah, criteria that the people who were proposing the parks uh, insisted on was that the buildings around them be built uh, as two story brick houses. And that, you know, and, but this was in the late 1830s, those projects never went through the brick only brick buildings we really have on this side of the city are located along Stetson Square, but we can see where there was a definite interest around that during that decade to have two-story brick homes. Um, brick homes did not occur on those parks and the, as it says <laughs> in these uh, historical accounts that the lots were then sold for taxes, but the parks do continue to exist. It's also interesting to notice the double houses. This was a common form more in Boston and brought up here. The double house is all over Bangor. If you look closely, you'll see them on Hammond Street. You'll see them around some of, in the 1830s to 1845. There were the construction of many double houses like this. 
And they're normally very symmetrical on each half. In this case, this, this bay was added, we think, later. This is the John Hamm house on the corner of Somerset that we just looked at on the, um, on the map. He was a mason. These were dating, as, as uh, Emerson says, from the early 1830s. Charles Bryan, again, very important architect in the style of Greek Revival. These are three examples of his buildings in this study area that are Greek Revival. The Norcross House, which is the survivor of the Great Fire. Um, up the street, we have several of his houses that are formed like this. And if you look above the columns, one of his signatures is he'll put a wreath above that. So the portico that you see on the Bangor House, uh, this is the Ken Cutting House. You look above the columns, Doric columns, you'll see wreaths located there, sometimes part of his signature on his buildings. This is a double house as well, the Kent Cutting House. And I think it's interesting, just as a transition from the last slide also, where the brick was being, uh, man or they were looking to include a lot of brick buildings, but then we were really seeing at the same time, what the potential that could be achieved in wood and how these classical buildings could be then represented through the use of wood, which was of course very important to Bangor at that time. This was how most of these families were making their wealth. Bangor again was the lumber capital of the world. So they're gonna feature wood as they have here. And the wood that was used was premium wood. This was first cut from virgin forests. So it's a, almost like a dense hardwood. It's much different than the pine that we would buy at Lowe's or Home Depot today. It's a much, much more durable wood. So these houses are still retaining the original wood for the most part on the outside of them, which is quite amazing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the various styles of architecture that's in the district. Um, here we have the Italianate style. Greek Revival style ran in Bangor from the 1820s, 30s, uh, from the end of the federal style, uh, all the way up till the beginning of this, what we call Italianate style buildings, which we we're seeing in the 1840s, but more primarily into the 50s and 60s. So again, we have some early examples. Here is Benjamin Dean's uh, Hayward Pierce house. Italianate styles, you can see, have similar strong roof lines, really deep shadows at the um, projected eaves of the front of the house. They're really stressing the vertical aspects. Um, you sometimes will see two over two windows and the patterns of the windows being much more narrow and tall. So whether it's a pediment that's closed like this or open, as we see here in many of the houses uh, that we encountered in the Tree Street area, which were later houses coming in in the 1860s, 50s to 70s. Um, but you see this beautiful Italianate detail. Oftentimes there's heavy bracket work, as you can see here uh, in the soffit uh, of the eaves, and even up the rake sometimes within the building, you'll see brackets. So these were really trying to feature strong geometric uh, architectural roof lines and stressing vertical aspects um, of the house. This is the uh, Second Empire style or the Mansur style that we see. Uh, we saw two applications tonight, the commission did. They were both of this style of, of uh, architecture, borrowed from France, um, beautiful detailed roofs and dormers that project off of these roofs. This was a real key feature. So these are just examples of some of the Second Empire architecture that was that was uh, reported on in this in our survey area. Many of the slate roofs that you see in this district, and I apologize, you can't zoom these up, but when you ride by these, take a close look because you'll see that they use really decorative and interesting ways to pattern the slate roof. This is a concave uh, mansard roof here. This is a straight mansard on this, in this case on Broadway. But if you look closely, when you go by these houses, you'll oftentimes see diamonds cut into the shapes of the uh, slates or sometimes fish scales uh, and other beautiful details that really draw your attention to the way that the architecture carries the roof line into the rest of the building. Again, stressing very tall vertical elements in this style as well. Stacked windows, strongly symmetrical. So another thing that we encountered um, during our study and documentation of these buildings during the survey was this uh, prototypical Bangor, kind of an archetypal house where we, um, which always kind of contained a lot of the same features, usually a gable front, a two bay facade, 
usually contained either an arch top round segmental arch or octagonal window at the third story level. Uh, it usually included Italianate detailing, so probably from a similar time frame, 1870s to around 1900 probably. Um, there was always, or generally a L that kind of came off of the main part of the house, but always on towards the north side, a lot, which was also the same side where the staircase was, allowing the primary rooms to have the southern exposure on the buildings. Mm -hmm which also is another important feature of these houses that they were always, they were typically, most typically oriented in east-west direction. So as to provide a maximum amount of uh, solar frontage to keep the houses warm throughout the winter months. The steep pitch roofs also contribute or relate back to our, our climate. Yeah, so as you can even see in the top picture here, along the north wall, there's fewer windows than you would see along the south side. Central chimneys is another feature that we also see consistently in these houses, which speak to, again, our, our north, cold northern climate, keeping the chimneys central allowed for the maximum amount of heat retention, rather than allowing the heat to escape through the side of the building with an mm -hmm. exterior chimney. I think we also see a difference in the shape of the parcels that were sold. In this case, uh, you can see that the houses were deep, so they had deeper lots. They were oftentimes narrower. And because they were narrower, they were building houses that actually fit the lots better. And as Emerson says, allowed for the sun to come in and shine pretty globally uh, through the entire width of the house, the length of the house. Um, colonial revival architecture is uh, another one that we see that comes in later. Here's some good examples. This one on Broadway, Colonial Revival House. Uh, the, the Bangor's four square, the box that we call the four squares in Bangor are actually a Colonial Revival House. So we're coming into later styles. These are in essence, large hip roofs with gables projecting off them, as you can see here. Oftentimes work themselves into a hip roof. So fair amount of Colonial Revival uh, architecture in the later buildings that were put in after the fire, especially. So this is interesting. I'll let Emerson cover this. this. We discovered very many of these buildings apparently were using or influenced by early pattern books. Well, during the 1850s to 1870s, the pattern book industry and building trade journals really exploded in this country in terms of being able to produce lithographs, drawings, and being able to share them widely. So we got to see how some of those things on a national uh, stage were starting to influence Bangor architecture. The house on the left, the octagonal house, we actually can see um, while the house as it exists on Grove Street today doesn't bear a whole lot of resemblance to the building, it is a the similar size and shape and would have a similar arrangement to the uh, design as published by Orson Square Fowler in his book on octagonal homes in 1850. And this home also dates to the year of 1850. So they are concurrent and about the same size, so we can assume some influences there. Um, the house on the right is actually 128 Broadway, where Mike and I currently are. Um, and we can see how George Orff actually used a detail for a porch that was published by Amos Jackson Bicknell in the 1870s. <laughs> he, he incorporated his own details to it, but essentially it's based on that design. Also from more trade journals, we have on the left um, a design from the Scientific American 18, yeah, 1887. And there are two of these houses actually located on Broadway, um, one of which is shown here. Um, and then on the right is actually kind of a more complicated history to this building. This house was, I believe, done in 1912 by, I believe it was, was a Manser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was involved. In yeah, Manser was involved in this house, but it was a reconstruction of a house that had been destroyed during the 1911 fire. The original house that it replaced was an 1899 design and the above design shown was also published by George Barber around 1899. So it can be assumed that the previous building was likely built to this, to this design. And actually this is a fairly common one. You actually, there's another example of this building up in Oakfield, Maine. <laughs> um, but you actually, this one is found throughout the country as well. Barber was very, popular architect in those days. Shop L, um, or the Cooperative Building Plan Association. And we see on the right here, um, he has a lot of designs throughout Bangor. We actually got to see this one on Elm Street. 
Um, and on the right, we have a design from DS Hopkins of Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, that is located on uh, Forest Avenue. Mm -hmm. This, this, this house actually combines features from various designs from the particular pattern book that was published in around 1895. This home was built in 1897. Mm. So we get to see actually a round bay that came from another design, a different uh, top to the tower than what was originally shown. But that, again, it came from the same book. They were just kind of recombined um, to form this, built, this particular unique Bangor example. And here we actually have some designs from the Ladies Home Journal from 1897. On the left, we have a house on Grove Street. Uh, this was actually one of the first designs by uh, what would become a very successful architect, uh, Walter J. Keith, who would later form the Keith Corporation. Many of his, his designs can be found throughout Bangor and the rest of the remainder of the state. And he was actually out of Minnesota. Um, the house on the right, we do not have an architect for, it just says by the journal special architect. But um, this is, building is actually was built in a reversed manner. So it's mirrored from the published design, but built on Pine Street. Um, earlier, I spoke about the Great Fire and the effect of the Great Fire of 1911 on, on this, uh, especially the Broadway district. This is the Nicholas Norcross house, the Charles Bryant design that we looked at, Greek Revival house. It survived the fire. <clears throat> but as you can see in the foreground, the structures between it and the, the building way up on Somerset Street were basically laid flat by the fire. This is the property that ended up being purchased by the diocese for the building of John Bapps. So you can see in the neighborhood and beyond that there's decimation everywhere. Bangor lost 11,000 trees. It was actually a tree plan after the fire to put back a lot of the trees that were lost. These trees were actually burned up and destroyed, which is an important, when you think of it, a loss in the city. So here's lost architecture. Yeah, some more examples of buildings that have been lost over time, whether it was to fires or to just a demolition. The building on the left is the Pine Street Methodist Episcopal Church by Charles Bryant from 1836. So, and that was lost in around 1880, I mean, sorry, 1982. That one, that burned. Obviously, uh, up in the right hand corner, we have the Ephraim Pauk House, which was destroyed and for the building of the Medical Arts Building. Um, and the building central below was also just another one of the brick buildings located on Stetson Square that at one point burned. And now we have those medical office buildings down there as well. And so here are some of the buildings that kind of came in to Broadway, the Broadway district with the removal of some of these buildings, whether by demolition or by fire, or in the case of um, the John Baptist High School, actually relocating one of the buildings. The um, the office building in the, the what used to be the Bangor Brewer Tuberculosis Center by uh, Cooper Milliken mm -hmm. up in the upper left. Um, that replaced an existing, uh, they, they, they demolished the house to build that. But it's interesting that the barn for that house actually still exists and it is the house next door. <laughs> it is now a double house next door. It was moved at some point prior to the building's demolition. We yep. believe sometime around 1920s or 30s for the, the um, during the depression, moving, you know, creating more housing. Mm -hmm. the, the one that I'm circling now is the property that um, was a large lot. The Ephraim Polk House was here, uh, probably built much closer to Somerset Street than, than this is. So just so you can see how changes occur. So in closing, some of the recommendations that came out of the report, and I'll read these to you. These are for the commission to consider and the city as time goes on. We ask that you consider adding the section of Broadway between Garland and South Park Street to the National Register of Broadway Historic District. Um, that would be working with the State Historic Preservation Office to encourage them to extend uh, that portion that's not included in the, in the National Register District. Number two was to extend the Tree Street study area from Somerset down to State Street, because as you probably all know, especially Lower Grove Street, there's some really important architectural buildings that occur in that, that zone between Somerset and State Streets. 
that may be uh, important for the commission to consider before maybe establishing a district or extension of a district um, from Broadway into the Tree Street area. Um, number three was to consider a study of double houses in Bangor. As we saw several examples of double houses, um, several exist here in our study area and they're, they're common around the city when you go looking. Or is to consider a study of pattern book architecture in Bangor as Emerson was just speaking, which may result in what's called a multiple property historic district. That's when, for instance, Grange Halls in the state of Maine are now listed as multiple property historic districts. Um, that means that they have a common use or a common theme and uh, can occur in other communities around the state uh, and be considered multiple property districts. Um, we, we uh, recommended you create an awareness campaign sharing what is known about Bangor's architectural heritage like we're doing tonight, yeah, and get the commission smart so they can carry the message out there as well. And um, to consider historic landmark designations for five um, identified buildings. And the five identified buildings that we uh, have, and some of these you may be familiar with, occur in diff different portions of the, the district many of them in the Tree Street District. Uh, matter of fact, all of these are in the Tree Street District. Um, so we've given addresses to those. That would be work for the commission. Um, that's part of your, your, um, your calling is to identify buildings that could be considered landmarks or identified as standalone landmark historic structures. And that's that. And in closing, I wanted to say, I'm looking at this beautiful old shot of taken across Bangor, you can see the church that Emerson just mentioned, uh, the Methodist church located here, uh, several of the brick buildings that some exist along Broadway, some no more. And in the foreground here, buildings that are no longer with us uh, may have been lost in the fire. But I'm just curious, they, they, where this photograph was taken to get to this elevation so high St. And uh, wondering if it was in St. John's Episcopal in the spire of the church to look out across. So, so there that that was what we wanted to share with the commission tonight. We had a blast and we learned a ton uh, doing this study. Um, and now the commission has that valuable information in front of them to use as you go forward um, when you consider any other actions in Bangor. So.